Thank you very much, Maria. We are ready to rock and roll. Andrea Mangucci versus Carlos Ramau. Esper Doom foretold. Or as he likes to call it, Esperone versus Demir Rogues. Who do you like in this matchup here, Money? Uh, I would probably give the edge to Carlos. Not by much, but I think it is a bit of a tough matchup for Esper Doom foretold. This is the type of deck that uh, people playing rogues are trying to target. Um, so I think Carlos has to be feeling better when uh, this is the matchup sitting across the table from him. So again, we're seeing a different kind of mill plan or a different kind of rogues plan, I should say, with the Zareth Sand. We see the Brazen Borrow, which has kind of fallen out of favor with a lot of the blue base decks. Um, w w do you see these cards having a big impact on the matchup? Uh, I think... The uh, specifically the brazen borrowers are more of a nod towards gruel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Zerasan it it is good against gruel, but it does tend to shine in this type of matchup just because the number of high impact permanents that Andreas deck has is a lot. And if you ever get a hit off with Zerasan and steal something like an Elspeth Conqueror's death, and yeah. then exile one of Andreas permanents and return something and tax, it can just be such a backbreaking series of events. Uh, but Brazen Borrower kind of low impact notably it is a very good card against specifically doom foretold you can pull off some uh brazen borrower tricks either to force your opponent to sacrifice the doom foretold or uh bring it in as a flash flyer to protect some, one of your other permanents during your upkeep so it does play well into doom foretold but overall this isn't a matchup where you're trying to have the brazen borrower all right. Now we saw there that the Soaring Thought Thief was a consideration for Carlos, but he decided to not fire it off. Here we're going to see Elspeth's Nightmare come down and deal with this uh, Thieves Guild Enforcer. Is this the reason why? Uh, yeah. The Soaring Thought Thief is definitely your more high impact creature. So when given the choice of which of these creatures you want to fall to Elspeth's Nightmare, you're going to let the Thieves Guild Enforcer go. Uh, mm -hmm. You do mill two less cards by playing the Thought Thief uh, here because you miss the mill from the attack. But protecting it is so valuable that it is worth it for Carlos to protect it in this position. All right, now we're going to see Zareth San get in on the action here. Sending back the Soaring Thought Thief to hand, gets in for the four points of damage, and is able to go and steal any permanent from the graveyard, and there is a Doom Foretold. So one way to deal with this Esper's, uh, excuse me, with this Elspeth's Nightmare is this powerful enchantment, but it's kind of, kind of like a double-edged sword, because it's like, okay, I get to play with this thing for one turn, but do I now flash in things to keep it on my battlefield? Is it is it worthwhile trying to keep around, or is it just a case of I'm going to now sacrifice this as soon as the turn comes back to Carlos Ramal. It, it really depended on what Andrea's turn looked like. Uh, what we know here is Andrea is very likely wanting to Heartless act this there, San, just to make sure that there's no uh, Drandalach or anything from Carlos to protect it, as Zerasan sticking around and getting more than one trigger. Usually one Zerasan trigger is it, very strong, but maybe beatable. Uh, two Zerasan triggers, it's almost impossible to come back from. Mm. Uh, so we see Andrea not risk it, just let it go, and there's the Drandalach lock off the top so great timing from him uh but yeah carlos no interest in keeping doom foretold around just to get rid of a golden egg from andrea at that point <laughs> for sure as we're not going to see agadim the undercrypt played as the land for turns send send the uh, turn back pass turn back soaring thought thief and the drawn on the lock in hand ready for whatever it is that might be coming down next could potentially be a yorion as we do see all three Available to Menguchi, a pretty uh, easy, easy pace as this Yorin is going to get drowned in the loch. Yeah, Andrea is uh, with the redundant copies of Yorin, happy to start jamming them in. If Carlos has a counter spell for one, uh, it's not the end of the world. It's not that bad for you. And if it were to resolve, a four far fire is actually pretty big against this rogue stack. Uh, mm -hmm. So getting to resolve it, you're very happy with on blocking duty or attacking duty, depending on what Carlos's turn looked like. And we're going to see the second copy of Yorin potentially come out here. Just to try and get some extra value off of this golden egg. Not much happening on the battlefield here for Andrea Mangucci. Still looking pretty good here for Carlos Ramau, who does have the Blood Chief's Thirst as an answer for the big flyer. Yeah, Andrea prioritizing 
getting the Big Bird Serpent down on the battlefield and trying to get that extra card off the Golden Egg. Uh, his draw is a bit clunky here. It does have access to that Glass Casket, but considering the Rogue deck typically has a lot of creatures uh, with Flash and here, specifically Carlos's build, even more so with the Brazen Borrowers, uh, Andrea just wants to make sure to get some sort of board presence down rather than go for a line like Glass Casket, which is a bit slower and less value-oriented. So we're going to forego the Petty Theft on the Brazen Borrower, just get an army of flyers down, make for a really, really big attack here next turn with this Blood Chief's Thirst on the Yorion Sky Nomad. So in we go for 10 points of damage, down to three goes Andrea Mangucci. Yeah, no main deck copies of Shadow of the Sky. So Andrea actually only has two copies, three copies of Extinction Event here. Uh, is able to potentially survive should he draw a land here, as I believe this will allow him to Elspeth Conquers Death, the Brazen Borrower, and Glass Casket, the Thieves Guild Enforcer, uh, allowing him to survive at a potential one life. Uh, I wonder if he has a good Dance of the Mans here, actually. Oh, he has a great Dance of the Mans. Never mind, this game is <laughs> still very much uh, anyone's game, as this should be able to return Elspeth Conquers Death, Elspeth Nightmare, and I believe a Glass Casket. Uh, I haven't had a good look at Andrea's Graveyard, uh, but if it is, then that'll just completely turn things around. Oh, yes. Finds exactly that, and also finds oh, a doom the foretold. Doom Foretold. Okay. Nice. That'll get the job done. For sure. So this is going to leave Carlos Romao without anything going for him. He's going to have to top deck like an absolute pro in order to get Carlos back in this Romao game. Carlos Romao has an option here. Uh, he can activate Castle Lockthrain. And if he draws a flash creature that costs two or less, he wins the game on the spot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's unfortunately, not that's it, not it. But it, it, it I, I, I love shot. that he saw that line so quickly. Yep. It was worth a shot. But here we've got the Brazen Borrower. So we'd love to find a second copy of a flash creature, like you mentioned, because this would also present lethal on the next turn. But it's going to be a really tricky uh, thing to get around. So Doom Foretold is going to sacrifice one of these uh, artifacts or enchantments that are going spare, kicking around here on, on Manguchi's side of the battlefield. Draws. Yeah, but that was that was Carlos's window. Uh, because now Andrea is going to keep around this Doom Foretold just to make sure Carlos isn't able to do something tricky like bring this mm. borrower in at end step, as well as have those two golden eggs, which notably are food, so you can still sack them for two mana to gain three life, and yeah. uh, now Andrea has everything he needs to win this game. Yeah, and a second copy of Doom Foretold, so that's going to be the concession from Carlos Roman. Unfortunately, Ooh. didn't find it. Didn't find what he needed to get that win. And uh, the players are going to go to sideboarding as we are going to go to a very short commercial break, but we'll be back before you know it. Welcome back to coverage of the MTG League weekend. We are taking a look at the sideboards here. What is it that we do as the Esper Doom foretold player as we see Andre Manguchi feverishly going through a sideboard? Uh, there's a bit of a shift that happens with the Esper Doom foretold deck in sideboarding. Because you're an 80 card deck, your main deck tends to feature a mix of cards that are good against creature decks and cards that are good against control. And then when you move to sideboarding, you typically do a much more um, stated sideboard uh, than you would realize with other decks. So here we saw Andrea take out some copies of Elspeth Conquer's Death. Makes a lot of sense. Even though there were the Brazen Borrowers in that game and the copies of Zara Sand, there aren't enough targets in the rogue deck to justify too many copies of, of an expensive enchantment like that. Uh, definitely wants to bring in those copies of Cling to Dust, one of the best cards in the matchup, as it really messes with all of the graveyard shenanigans that the rogue deck is trying to do. Uh, turns their Into the Stories off and 
Yeah, this game is already looking horrendous for Carlos. Is a mulligan yeah. to five for him. And Multi five Andre is not a great start. Oh my goodness me! So cling to dust, able to just chow whatever it is that's relevant in the graveyards, and uh, I mean, drown in the lock is a great card, but you kind of need something to get going here. As you can just see the shake of the head from Carl Carlos Romero, he know that he knows that he is very much on the back foot at this point. He's going to have to find something to get him out of this pickle as he that's finds a maze mind tome. Yeah, Maze Mountain Time is certainly a very good card. It's it's kind of reminiscent of um, Treasure Map from Ixalan. Yeah, absolutely. Some of those similar it, kind of vibes. It, it's one of those cards that it doesn't give you immediate value, mm -hmm. uh, even though it kind of does because it has the scry ability. But it, it gives you a limited number of uses, and it's up to you to really make the most of them. And I think I love cards like this that just allow you to have more choices for how to make the most of your card advantage. Speaking of choices, Andrea Mangucci is spoiled for choices. You just look at his hand. He's got everything you could possibly want. And the kitchen sink. <laughs> In yeah, this matchup. Carlos looking at another drown the lock with zero cards in Andrea Mangucci's graveyard. That is an excellent mm. draw, as Andrea would love to slam a Doom Foretold on this turn and deal with that Maze Mind Tome, but now Carlos has an answer for it. Yes, he does. So a timely negate off the top here for Carlos Romero. The Maze Mind Tome already putting in some work and uh, getting Carlos's foot slightly in this game. Uh, <laughs> Andrea is trying to just shut the door on him entirely. Doom Foretold on the stack. Going to draw a card first and foremost. You're working with Brazen Borrow off the top. Real. And it's going to allow it to resolve? Interesting. Interesting. Oh, yeah. okay. It's going to send it back. It's like, I'm going to play the tempo game. Do it again. Next turn. I dare you. Yeah, I, I, I like this line from Carlos making the most of his brazen bar and forcing Andrea to do it again the next turn. And Andrea, if he does draw a Fabled Passage, uh, we'll have this Mystical Dispute back up. But I'm guessing we're not going to see Carlos fall into the trap of missequencing this. He'll lead with Negate and then either play Borrower as an attacker or activate Maze My Tome. And Carlos is digging himself out of this game pretty nicely. Mm-hmm. Just deciding which land he wants to grab here. Making sure he can play all of his spells that he wants to. Oh. Maze Mind Tome. Okay. Uh-oh. Digging for it. Carlos. I... So not putting Andrea on the Mystical Dispute with that Fabled Passage up. Yeah, that's going to be really unfortunate. Here. And I think Carlos is going to feel pretty bad when he sees this mystical dispute come out. Uh, he does have the Maze Mind Tome on four counters now, so or able to go to four counters. So it's not the end of the world uh, if this Doom Foretold actually resolves, but this was something that was preventable if Carlos wanted to do so. Yeah. So now the choice between do I activate this Maze Mind Tome, get it off the battlefield entirely, that makes Doom Foretold go away. Besides, nope, not yet. Yeah, Carlos wants to keep that Doom Foretold in play right now. Uh, doesn't want to be discarding and wants to at least force Andrea to make a decision on his turn whether to keep it around or not. Mm -hmm. Temple of Deceit scries, finds a Thieves Guild Enforcer on top of the library. Is this impactful enough now at this point? Carlos thinks so. As he passes the turn back, and Doom Foretold is going to trigger, causing the sacrifice on the Golden Egg. Yeah, Mill 2 is absolutely not irrelevant when there's a Drown Lock and an Into the Story in hand. Uh, and with that Brazen Borrower in the Adventure Zone, it's actually more like a Mill 4 if it is resolved and doesn't face a removal spell. So from mm -hmm. Carlos's point of view, the Thief Skilled Enforcer more or less turns on the rest of his hand. Unfortunately, though, that copy of Cling to Dust is waiting in Andrea's hand, and that can really mess up a lot of what Carlos is planning here. Well, first things first, Treacherous Blessing on the stack, Drown on the Lock, is going to potentially deal with this. In response, we're going to Cling to Dust, though. This doesn't blanket, though, right? No, not, unfortunately just, not. Just, just, in essence, replacing itself, so... Sackles exiling something from Andrea's graveyard won't cause this to uh, to blank. 
Or no, fizzle as Andrea a drink. could could use it to try to draw a counter spell. Uh, mm -hmm. There are four mystical disputes in his uh, post board build, so it, it is certainly possible that he draws a card off of this and finds another copy of that mystical dispute. However, unlikely it may be in the eighty card deck. Uh, he would love to force this treachery, treacherous blessing through, uh, mm -hmm. which is why he does end up going for it. But it, it's unfortunate that. It was the exact number of cards in the graveyard that didn't impact it. Yeah. All right, so no cards for you, friend. Says Carlos Ramel as the Brazen Borrower now makes its way onto the battlefield. Carlos continues not wanting to discard and keep this Doom Foretold around, mm -hmm. uh, saying that he values uh, this land in hand more than the copy of Brazen Borrower in the Adventure Zone. Ooh, Wagadim's Awakening. That's a nice pickup. It, it would be better it, if there was okay. a bit more. Yeah, it would be better if there were more things in the graveyard. Yeah. So that's going to go to the back. It, that's the type of card that if Carlos was in a better position, he would mm -hmm. have the luxury of keeping on top. But considering he's feeling quite behind right now with only two cards left in hand, this into the story still at full cost. And Andrea's hand looking looming with four cards in it and a cling to dust in the graveyard. Uh, Carlos just feels the need to send it away. Mm, I think we'll get to seven here now with the Thieves Guild Enforcer Mill into the story being fired off. No response or no way to stop this from happening from Andrea and they would find Seagate Restoration as well as Maze Mind Tome with a couple of lands off of that into the story. Yeah, that was Carlos really making the most of the window that he had uh, because after this turn, Cling to Death was ensure, was able to ensure Andrea's graveyard size was kept at a reasonable amount. So Carlos's mm -hmm. Graveyard Matters cards wouldn't be turned on. Uh, and here, Andrea actually has the option of uh, escaping Cling to Dust to make his graveyard smaller, which would then allow him to Elspeth's Nightmare, the Steed's Guild Enforcer. So this should end up being a pretty nice sequence for him. Mm. Great value turn here for Andrea Mangucci coming up, if that's the way that he decides to go. That line would also turn off our dance, the, or turn off the dance of the man's for Mangucci, who seems to be going for that. Yeah, I, I think four? it is just uh, the dance of the mass here is so strong and, and it does put your graveyard size in check anyways that Andrea yeah. ends up deciding, I, I don't want to exile my graveyard before using this dance and Ooh. just sequences it that way instead, which ends up being really nice for him as he yeah. does draw a ton of cards and the Stoop Fertile will still deal with the Enforcer. Oh, <laughs> you nice. You from Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> you can only chuckle at this deck once it gets going and executes the game plan that it wants to. So, finding a couple of nice cards there in the Archon of Sun's Grace, which is great against the Rogue deck, as well yeah, as a is, Skyclave Apparition. This is the second game we've seen this uh, Dance of the Mance from uh, Andrea's Esper deck just be so clutch in this matchup as another way of making use of the graveyard that Carlos's effects are really giving to him. The incidental pieces of mill here and there are the reason that Andrea is able to have this sort of big explosive effect this early on in the game. So here we see Seagate Restoration drawing cards. No more hand size for you. Goes for a cling to dust on the opposing cling to dust straight away while Miguchi's tapped out. So no more graveyard munching for you there. No more graveyard munching, but Andrea has the world available to him. Guess mm -hmm. rid of his treacherous blessing. Has the option now to go Archon of Sun's Grace mm -hmm. uh, plus uh, Elspeth's Nightmare or even an additional Doom Foretold here if he wants to get rid of both on uh, Carlos's turn and mm -hmm. trade them for two two twos and two cards uh, from Carlos's hand. Seems like a good plan to me. Just considering if there's anything else that he wants to do with this turn. But it is going to be the Doom Foretold that comes down, creates a Pegasus, and now both Doom Foretolds are going to fire off. Discarding a land. And discard another Fabled Passage. So just preventing any additional catching. Might be out of basics at this point, but I don't, I don't think so. And this battlefield looks a little scary here, Marnie. I'm not going to lie. 
Yeah, this is not the type of battlefield Rogue deals well with. Uh, there's no board wipes in the Rogue mm-hmm. stack, and even if there were, it, you're not bringing your board wipes in against Esper Doom, foretold. That's not a winning strategy for the <laughs> matchup. So now the fact that Andrea has gone wide uh, means Carlos is continuing to feel pressure, and the only creature available in Carlos's hand is that copy of Zerasa and the Trickster, but Andrea has the Heartless Act and the Elspeth Conqueror's Death ready. Yep. So that one's not going to be long for this world. Goes for the Agadim's Awakening to get back the Thieves' Guild and Force on the Brazen Borrow just to get some semblance of a threat down on the battlefield and get a couple cards milled. Mills another cling to dust. Oh, look at Cart. He is unhappy. Oh, with what is man. This is, this is the window where he's not able to escape his cling and he knows that whatever Andrea does on his turn, it, it is very likely to include that cling to dust in his graveyard, exiling Carlos's. Oh, yes. And if it doesn't, if that just means that Carlos is that much further behind as well. <laughs> Swing in here for a big old chunk of damage. Brazen Borrower not opting to block. Yeah, down to seven he goes. Down to seven. This army of flyers is just going to keep increasing with what's in the hand here. Skyclave Apparition going to come down. Steal one of these rogues. Which one's which one's more of a nuisance? Yeah, these Gildan forces are. This is a bit of a pain in the backside. It's not even just about nuisance. Just it, if your apparition goes away, you'd rather be giving your opponent a one-one token, <laughs> and you're removing both these Fair. creatures anyways. Yeah. Eliminate, taking care of the brazen borrower. Yeah, Andrea just driving home the message to Carlos. I didn't even th- care about that cling to dust. You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> this well, game still... is. You could have still fired it off if you wanted to, but opts to go for the golden egg here. It's going to get mystically disputed. Yeah, I, 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 Andrea knows that this is not the type of board state that Rose comes back from. Mm-mm. Into the story is the start. That is uh, a card that could give Carlos the tools to deal with this, but Rogues, mm-hmm. you know, needs mana to also deal with this type of board state. And yeah. four mana gone, yes, you have four more cards, but it's just not going to let you do anything. Not going to do it this time for Carlos Ramaz. Andrea Mangucci picks up a very convincing 2 with the Esper Doom Foretold deck. So congratulations to Andrea. Continues his winning ways. So uh, thank you very much for hanging out with us today, my friends, if you are joining us wherever you are around the world. Appreciate you being here as we check out the MPL during this league weekend. We're going to go to a very short commercial break, but when we're back, we'll have... Oh, we're actually going to an interview with Andrea Mangucci. So let's go hear what he has to say. Hey everybody, I'm here with Andrea Mangucci, who just beat Carlos Ramau, locking up 11 wins for himself so far in the MPL League play, playing this really cool Esper Doom Foretold list, which I see you tweet about all the time. You have a special name for it. Can you explain that name for people at home? All right, the neck of the, 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 the name of the deck is Esperone, which is basically the name that I'm referring to Esper Control ever since like War of the Spark came around. So since... Uh, Pretty long time ago at this point, and uh, I really enjoy playing control decks. I'm really been enjoying Doom Foretold since, uh, I guess, since they banned Uro. You know, still it wasn't very good in that brief time, but yeah, now it's pretty good, and I I like its position in the meta game. Yeah, and uh, talk to me a little bit about Esperone and the uh, the suffix meaning something in Italian, meaning big. Yeah, so Esperone means uh, so in Italian uh, you have Eno for something small like. You know, Esperino and Esperone. And uh, back in the days of Esper Hero, I, I was playing the control version, the one with Kaios Wrath. And, you know, so I was playing Esperone. And now, you know, Esper Hero is gone, but I'm still playing uh, the control version of the deck. I love it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about people who have brought a Mardu version of this Doom hmm. Foretold deck? Why do you think Esper is better if you do? So I really think that Omen of the Sea gives you a lot to this deck. Omen of the Sea is a great cantrip. So you see that uh, Raphael Levy is playing uh, Lethal Form Bright, I believe it's called, and it's the, the, the enchantment that draws a card. 
Yeah. I mean, Omen of the Sea is just much better than that. And once you draw one Omen of the Sea, your Yorian will be better. Your Dance of the Mans will be better. Of course, you also have access to Dance of the Mans. And then you have access to Mystical Dispute, which is a great answer to Soaring Thought Thief or Into the Story. So you're also better against Rogue. Sure, you might be slightly worse against Gruul, but I honestly didn't... I mean, sure, like, Gruul is a very good deck, but I didn't expect, like, you know, 12 Gruul. I was still expecting a bunch of other decks. And... I would say I kind of got it right since I'm only playing against four gruels in these 11 rounds this weekend. So I really like the the, the, the deck choice. And uh, yeah, pretty pretty happy with uh, with the list. I've seen many oh, people you... playing Maze Mind Tome over Golden Egg, and that's the thing that I really dislike mainly. Yeah, you've got to have the Golden Egg. I saw you talking about it in chat too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For you overall... Golden Egg fixing money. No, go, go. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, fixing, <laughs> fixing mana is so important in this list as you were pointing out. Yeah, exactly. Fixing mana, gaining life, it really does a lot of things. And often you don't have time to, to, to spend two mana on it. So for you overall in this league weekend uh, tournament structure, we're on the second of seven of these league weekends. How has it been for you playing these high stakes magic matches uh, from home? I, I generally, pref I mean, obviously, just like everybody else, I prefer way much in paper tournament. But I've been preferring these kind of events because they are uh, fast. Mostly the rounds, you know, don't take an hour and a half like most of the, the others have played. And also there are only like six rounds and they so they don't go up until 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, around 11 p.m. I, I finish my, ma I, my my matches and I'm I'm satisfied. And I would say that the time zone is mainly the thing that you know, I, I, I really prefer it this way. So have you been uh, having some extra good Menguchi cu cuisine when you're uh, at home all the time? Yes, yes, yes. I managed to always uh, sneak in some uh, some good meals in the weekend. I kind of plan it because I tell my father that I won't be able to have dinner with them, so we have to have a special lunch. So, you know, in these weekends on Saturday and Sunday, I'm having always good lunch. Awesome. I love to see your tweets about the great food that you're eating. Andrea Mangucci, uh, best of luck to you the rest of this Thank weekend you. and through the rest of the league. Thanks for talking with me. Hello and welcome to The Bolt, your rapid fire introduction to the most exciting players in Magic. And right now I've got Canister on the line. Canister, how you doing? Pretty well. Good, we'll get straight into some questions. What is the best color of mana? Colorless. Well, that's not a color, but KCA produces it. Do you have a favorite format? Yes, modern. Do you have a card that you really hate to see across the table from you? I get really annoyed by Karn, the Great Creator, as it's a card that does a regular thing, but also has a 10% chance to be an absolute killer for your deck if your archetype just happens to be artifact-based. Oh, yeah, fair. So that would be it. Do you have a favorite uh, color combination? Blue-green, because it's strong. <laughs> yeah. Uh... What do you prefer, aggro or control? Control, but somewhat like not as hardcore point contest control as many would prefer. Is there another player in MPL or Rivals that you think is kind of like your rival in the league, someone you want to beat? Yes, it's uh, Andrea Mengucci. <laughs> I'm, one day I'm going to best him. Is, uh, is he the kind of the player who just always gets you? Not really, but he got me that one time in the in the finals of the Mythic Invitational okay. past year, and oh, you gotta get revenge! <laughs> ever since that, I'm dead set on taking my revenge. Uh, I'll ask you some non-magic questions. Uh, do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? I don't think so. I would typically not expect to ask for a sandwich in a, a store or a restaurant and get a hot dog. What's the country with the best food? Uh, not Poland. <laughs> uh, one last question for you. Where can we find you online? Twitter.com slash canister underscore MTG. Twitch.tv slash canister underscore MTG. YouTube.com slash canister. Awesome. Not MTG. <laughs> Hey, 
Hey everybody, welcome back to coverage of MTG League Weekend. Maria Bartholdi here joined by Ailey Loney and Imani Davuti. While we're still here in round number nine, we've got another feature match for you here coming up, including a deck a lot of people are pretty excited to see. Let's find out which players we'll be watching here as our backup match here in round nine. It is Piotr Glogowski, a.k.a. Canister, and Chris Kavartek, the new kid on the block. That's right, I just gave him that nickname. I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, <laughs> seven wins for Piotr, eight wins for Chris, who started off with kind of a rocky weekend uh, a couple weekends ago for the first of these league weekends but yesterday managed to 4-1 his matches with mono green food but first we're going to peek at Piotr's deckless gruel adventures we've been seeing it all day yesterday and today anything here specifically that you want to call out at all Monty? Yeah this is a bit of a different build of gruel though than we're used to seeing the main things to look at are the two copies of stone coil serpent and the three copies of gem razor this build feels like it's a bit more tuned to try to answer some of these esper decks while also having some splash advantage against the gruel mirror by being able to answer cards like the great henge and ember cleave with reasonable main deck cards uh but in order to do so, uh, Piotr is giving up on some of the main deck copies of Fire Prophecy that we're used to seeing. There's less scavenging oozes, there's less uh, cards like Vivian Monster's Advocate, no main deck Questing Beast, no main deck Primal Might. So there's definitely some give and take here in order to get some of these uh, more main deckable hate cards like Gem Razor in there. Let's peek at Chris Kavartek's deck list, this mono green food list that I know some people have had their eye on here. He talked about it with uh, Magic Esports on Twitter and said, I dismissed this deck initially because it felt underpowered, but once I cut bad cards <laughs> like Wolf Little Haven and Kogla and added good cards like Lovestruck Beast and Henge, the deck began to feel way better, Mani. Yeah, I mean, this mono green food deck is still a bit of an unknown entity in the standard format. We're not really sure how it fits in and where its place is. But what we do know for sure is Wicked Wolf is really good against Gruul. And that's one of the primary reasons we see people running this deck is it may be the best Wicked Wolf deck. And it, another card that just hasn't really had its day in the sun and standard yet, but is a very powerful card, is the Feasting Troll King. So this is a deck that is trying to max maximize uh, those cards while also being able to play such powerful cards like Bonders Enclave, having a land that is able to provide you constant card advantage. So I like a lot of what this food deck is doing, but we're still not sure if this is the real deal or if it's more trying to be cute. Okay, so I'm super interested to see if this thing can take it down. And yeah, that Feasting Troll King just does not stay dead. <laughs> sometimes dead is better anyway uh let's get down to the feature match. i'm gonna stop quoting pet cemetery take it away <laughs> thank you very much maria all right well here we go friends we are riding along with chris kovartek on the bottom of your screen with piotr Lugowski up at the top there gruel adventures versus mono green food now i've played around with this mono green food deck a little bit and it can do some silly things money if i'm not mistaken it can get Feasting Troll King out on turn three. If you get Goose into the Tangled Florahedron with the... No, we need one more mana. We need one more for the Castle Garenbrig then to be able to get the Goose... Uh, then to be able to get the Feasting oh, Troll King out. That'll so. do. Uh, three? Turn yes. one, land Goose. Turn yep. two, land Florahedron. So it's possible, for sure. That is the quote-unquote dream draw uh, oh, yeah. of getting the Feasting Troll King down. Troll King is very impressive against these creature matchups like Gruul because it has the power combination of Vigilance and Trample. So it's good on attacking, it's good on blocking, and it it's recurrable, so it's just kind of a threat that doesn't really die. The fact that this deck can generate uh, enough food to bring you back multiple times, even despite the fact that you it itself only generates three food, uh, mm -hmm. is part of why it fits so well into this deck. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a six-cost creature, so if you don't have that sort of dream curve, it can end up being a liability sometimes. It can that, so we'll have to see what happens as Chris Kovartek had a bit of an unfortunate mulligan to five, but two Lovestruck Beasts come in to save the day and just uh, keep the creature count higher than what Chris Kovartek was looking at initially with that hand that he kept. 
Yeah, double love strike beast, five five bodies, really good against Gruel. It's one of the cards that we see most just halt the aggression in the Gruel mirror is because neither player is able to attack through the other one's love struck beast. And for Kavartek, who is behind on this board, behind in this game, uh, this is the type of card he needs to buy him some time. Maybe get a couple of activations off of that Bonders Enclave and try to recoup the card advantage that he lost uh, in those mulligans. Yeah, but now we're going to see something I was wondering if uh, Glagowski was going to do. Gem Razor onto the Brushfire Elemental. Just going to make a big old 6-6 six, six and start smacking you around, Chris Kavartek. Big old chunk of damage there. Yeah, that's a great way of getting through this Love Struck Beast as that Gem Razor is now representing uh, a six power attacker. And it, this is a really interesting uh, attack from Chris Kvartek as it's indicating that he has no intentions of trying to block this Gem Razor. Uh, as a single landfall uh, trigger now makes it bigger than the Love Struck Beast. And mm -hmm. fortunately for Glugowski, uh, he has a Fabled Passage in his hand, so he has access to more than one landfall trigger should he need it. Seems to be deliberating and weird though not to play out the Shadow Skull Smashing. What, yeah, what do you think is his reasoning? It's because of the Ember Cleave in hand. It's because Golgowski wants to save the Fabled Passages double triggers uh, for the next turn where he's able to play Ember Cleave. He doesn't mm -hmm. need the extra two damage this turn to attack through this Love Struck Beast. So now he's able to play Scavenging Ooze and keep up Stomp and next turn have Fabled Passage plus this Brushfire Gem Razor monstrosity <laughs> uh, to have a 9-9 nine, nine double strike trample uh, and Kvartek will be only able to watch uh, in horror as his life total disappears. <laughs> Dwindles beyond beyond hope as uh, Bone Crusher Giant just going straight to face down to five now. Here come the lands. Here comes yeah, the cleave. That... This game's going to be over very, very quickly. That's Klugowski making a statement that you have 12 toughness. I have 18 trample. <laughs> Five <laughs> will not be enough for you to survive. And doesn't even attack with the scavenging goose. Is not going to wait for Kavartek to block. He's going to send the message of, <laughs> you are dead. Let's go to game two. Yes. Dear friend, you are dead. May we proceed to game two? Yes, says Chris Kavartek. As we are going to go to a very short commercial break when we come back, more from the MTG League weekend. Friends, we are checking out the sideboards here for both players now. Bogowski absolutely just ran over Chris Kavartek there, playing the big dumb green deck, might I add. Uh, but Ghoul just so, so good. It, it was very close. Yes. Competitive. <laughs> That's not to say that this green deck can't do things, though. We've seen uh, Kavartek has been having a pretty good weekend so far, but maybe, just maybe, this Gruul deck is just way too good. We'll see here as we go into the post board. Game number two here between Rural Adventures and Mono Green Food. Chris Kavartek on the play, leading off with a Gilded Goose. Yeah, I think Kvartek's deck is absolutely able to put up a fight in this matchup, but it, it's really difficult when you're starting off on five cards as well. And that first game was just pretty unfortunate for Chris. Wasn't able to really put together uh, anything he needed to cobble off um, that ideal position. Yeah, and here we're going to see Lugoski with a similar start, you know, getting a bunch of creatures down, potentially finding something for Gem Razor to hop onto and go along for the ride, but no Brushfire Elemental, unfortunately, as uh, that would have been the ideal mutate target there. So just yeah, Agile Innkeeper. Chris really valuing his curve and getting this Elder Gargaroth down on time on turn four. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this <laughs> resulted in him actually opting not to play Kazandu Mammoth on turn two, uh, saying that my curve for this Gargaroth is more important than my curve for this Mammoth, as I'm not going to be the overall aggressor in this matchup. Uh, and that was why he actually opted to make a food on turn two instead. Yeah. Unfortunately, we know. Chris won't know yet, though, that uh, there's Necron War just ready and waiting to gobble up this Gargaroth on Glagoski's turn four. So as good as this is, the Elder Gargaroth, it doesn't do anything as it enters the battlefield. So it's potentially going to get taken here by the Akron War. It is almost certainly going to get taken here by the Akron War. Uh, but fortunately for Chris, he does have that wilt. So this isn't game ending, though you do see him <laughs> just have this like slight nod of defeat as uh, the Akron War comes down to take his Gargaroth. We'll get it back here, though. This poor Gargaroth is going to be so so summoning sick. It's almost like uh, getting you know car sickness. This is like this whoop 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 whoop. You're mine. Constantly you're mine. Suddenly reeling, <laughs> being relocated forcibly. Poor little guy. Well, poor big guy, I should say. That thing is enormous. Quite the large gentleman. <laughs> As we're going to see, Kazandu Mammoth join its herd. And swing in for five, down to ten, and thirteen is Chris Kavartek's life total at the moment. Yeah, Chris does have access to this Embercleave. Uh, mm -hmm. No third red mana to try to put together a lethal with Embercleave plus Rimrock Knight, as that would be uh, something that could catch Kavartek off guard. Uh, but as it stands, I think this game is looking quite good for Kavartek. Uh, unlikely for him to uh, throw his Gargaroth in the way of a Love Strike Beast if mm -hmm. uh, Glugowski is telegraphing an Embercleave. Uh, so instead, Glugowski just decides to develop further and try to set up for potentially a more explosive next turn in terms of attacks. Yeah, just getting a bunch of creatures down, trying to overwhelm Kvartek, who uh, is going to try and string together something here with the Trail of Crumbs. Does have the goose and the food, so can get that powerful combo off. We'll just be able to dig through the library. But first things first, let's go swinging and see what creatures we can get off this battlefield. Yeah. I think Vartek realizes that these Mammoths and this Gargaroth uh, have less value as blockers as time mm -hmm. goes on, and this Gruel deck has the ability to draw its Ember Cleaves. So instead, he's just going to put the pressure on, get the attack in with the Mammoths as 5-5s, five and make a beast to keep Glogalski's board in check while expanding his board further. Yeah. Shadow Skull smashing off the top there. That'll be a way to get rid of these 3-3s. Three when they're not unable to uh, boost themselves up. Also, gem rays are a consideration. It's a little awkward, though, mutating it onto the Lovestruck Beast, so perhaps we see a Scavenging Ooze come down to get rid of this Trail of Crumbs. Yeah, I really don't want to put gem rays or a love strike beast and <laughs> uh, almost waste it, but at the same time, it's just a matter of what is... Uh, Glogowski's second card going to be here. I think Scavenging Ooze makes a lot of sense. He doesn't have the life total to spare to play the Shadow Skull Smashing untapped. So this looks like a pretty good turn for a Scavenging Ooze. Gem Razor tapped Shadow Skull Smashing, uh, which would turn on that Ember Cleave Rimrock Knight combo for the mm -hmm. next turn that would potentially give uh, Glogowski a lethal out. Unfortunately, I do think... Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I do think we're going to see Kavartek eat one of these foods on the end step and pad that life total a bit, as well as draw a card with this Trail of Crumbs. Oh. I'm going for it. Ballsy. It, 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 I don't really see how this works out uh, well... For Glogowski, it, I guess it is uh, just pushing some damage through, but there's no real reason for Chris not to just take this damage. Yeah, with the food being available. Yeah, I, honestly, I think I would like to see him make uh, Glogowski have it, but 
it, as it stands, I think this is just as fine of a chump block, um, and this will allow Chris to still get the goose activation, uh, and then Glugalsi will likely take the creature gem razor line uh, after the fact. Okay. He may actually need to play two creatures and let the trail go uh, just to feel safer in terms of blockers, play the scavenging ooze and a gem razor just as a 4 4. Are there copies of, um, yeah, there's four questing beasts in the sideboard, so I was going to have to be careful of that. So we'll want to get the bigger blockers down. I don't believe Chris brought in the questing beasts, if I saw correctly in mm -hmm. sideboarding. I, I think the questing beasts, he's more aiming at a matchup like Esper, uh, or maybe Rogues, that can't really block it well. Okay. Uh, Gruul tends to have a lot of decent-sized blockers for it, especially this build from Glugowski that has the gem raisers as additional 4-4 blockers. Uh, so potentially just um, Chris looking for something like a Wicked Wolf here to try to push through lethal. Yeah. Unfortunately, he doesn't find it, just grabs a land, finds another Trail of Crumbs with the Trail of Crumbs activation before the Gem Razor dealt with it. If only these if only these mammoths had Trample, right? That's probably what uh, Kavartek's thinking. If only. Have you met a mammoth? They're pretty large. They should have Trample. <laughs> I mean, these mammoths are so large that they can literally be valleys. So <laughs> they're they're pretty massive mammoths. <laughs> this is true. They're very delicate though too. No stomping or trampling for them as they both swing in here. Ten points of damage. Easy chump block here for one of these creatures to get in the way. Well, two of these creatures to get in the way, I should say. Yeah, given that Kavartek is at a much higher life total now, I wouldn't be surprised to see Glogowski trade off the Gem Razor plus uh, Rimrock Knight potentially uh, for one of these mammoths. But no, he's just valuing keeping the Scavenging Ooze and uh, choosing to shrink his board instead. Mm -hmm. Scavenging Ooze hiding out underneath that Gem Razor. Sometimes it's easy to forget that they're they're hanging out together, those two creatures. We do have activations available there. We've got a second gem razor. And we also have an ember cleave, which isn't going to be lethal at this point. We need another 1-1 one, one down on this battlefield to get the love struck beast going again. Yeah, Glugowski opted to sacrifice both 1-1s once, one, once, uh, to keep this scavenging goes gem razor around. So won't be able to attack with that love struck beast anymore. So a couple options in hand here for Glugowski. What do you see him going for? Hey, honestly, none of these seem overly good. Uh, casting another Gem Razor as a 4-4 four, four here, uh, saying that you're going to keep that Trail of Crumbs, but at least you're out of food right now. And he'll have access to two activations of Scavenging Ooze. Probably the best he could go for here. At least it should help stabilize the board, as uh, even with a land drop, Kvartek won't really have great attacks into a 6-6 six, six scavenging. It was at a 5-5 five, five Lost Truck Beast. Oh, wow. Interesting. So, Kvartek would go to 4 with the two activations off the scavenging ooze. He wants to keep getting damage through. So, in for 6. Yeah, but this is Golgowski now committing to going to one and chump blocking one of these mammoths, trading with the other, uh, all to put Kvartek down to 13. Uh, this is the potential for a pretty large attack with the... Uh, with the Embercleave Rimrock Knight, as well as, uh, I believe, only one Scavenging Oof activation right mm -hmm. now available to him. But he knows about this Elder Gargaroth in Kvartek's hand, so even though this would be a 20-point attack there, Elder Gargaroth would be able to block plus gain 3 life to actually prevent this from being lethal from Golgowski. So it's looking like Chris Kvartek is going to pick up this victory here. I mean, unless... Kvartek doesn't block? Is that the only way that Golgowski wins this one? 
Kvartek is definitely blocking. I think the only way Glogoski wins this one is if Kvartek doesn't choose to gain three life. And I don't think that is uh, something Chris will choose not to do, given that he'll, once the block happens, Chris will think about his ways to lose this game. Mm-hmm. And I, I think at that point, the only way would be exactly Ember Cleave Rimrock Knight. And if Chris goes through that thought process, he'll land on gaining three life to ensure that out doesn't exist. Yeah, not even an attack there. So we're just going to see a swing here. And a victory for Chris Kvartek as we're going to go to a game number three very shortly. Uh, just going through no the motions. victory yet. No victory yet. The scavenging oh, scavenging is, is right. Three activations in it. It's hanging out still. Gosh, you're a sneaky little blighter, aren't you? Yeah, these gem razored creatures are getting us. Uh, <laughs> they are. I, I got caught by the brush fire elemental in game one. Now the scavenging <laughs> is in game two. They're just hiding under there, you know? They are hiding. It's all right. They got us both now. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me thrice? I, I don't know. Just don't fool us again, Gem Razor, is what we're saying, basically. As a 9-9 now exists on the battlefield, no attack yet from Kavartek. Both players playing very, very carefully for aggressive decks. But uh, that's what you got to do to stay alive here and make sure you get those points in this Magic League weekend. Still two creatures in the graveyard. So Glogowski now has available to him a 10-10 with Uzzah's activation. Uh, mm -hmm. 11 with Embercleave, 13. So he's representing potentially 26 damage here uh, while putting himself up to 5 life. So with this attack, uh, if Glogowski goes for it, Kvartek would have to find a way to survive 26 points of damage while also keeping uh, lethal available to him. And I don't think it's possible. So I, I think Glogowski is actually going to put this game in <laughs> a pretty great position for himself with this attack. All right, so Gem Razor in the red zone. Just one more consideration. Is this the only one we want to go with? Do we want to go with the Brush Fire Elemental 2? All right, here we go. Right, Everything so blocked. For, for <laughs> Kvartek, I think the best blocks are uh, Gargaroth plus Lovestruck Beast, because you want to diversify your blockers. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be 11, and then you would need <laughs> to gain three life uh, to play around exactly what Glogowski has. Uh, I think at this point, it may be difficult for Kvartek to play around this Rimrock Knight. He may not choose to do so, and that could end up getting him, because yeah. it's very tempting from Kvartek's point of view to make a blocker here. Uh, and that would be really unfortunate if he makes a 3-3 to try to push Lethal through. So the 1-1 one, one getting on the blocking action to just deciding what else he wants to commit to this gem razored scavenging ooze. A Ailey, I'm worried. I'm this scared. This looks like Chris is blocking 12 and is about to make a 3-3, and he will get very punished by that Rimrock Knight. Oh, no. It's like watching a car crash in slow motion. I believe with that 3-3, Glogowski has secured it by having 14 points of damage, and this was the one missing piece of the calculation for Kvartek. Uh, really hard to do all of the math and end up on exactly Rimrock Knight as the yeah. out, but I think when Glogowski plays this, and he's done the math, he's aware that this is going to be lethal, uh, it is going to end the game in Pyotr Glogowski's favor. Man, what a turn of events. Here we were thinking Chris Kvartek's going to win this pretty easy peasy, but nope. Legoski was playing for this exact moment right here. Gem Razor munching on a couple things in the graveyard. Incredible. And then a Rimrock Knight to finish things there off. Is. Look at Kvartek's See the face. Sigh of frustration from K Chris Kvartek. Oh my that goodness was the me. exact sequence he could. He could have played around, but it wouldn't have given him uh, 